program manager at the Delta Science Program, which is within the Delta Stewardship Council. In a second, I'm going to give you a brief orientation to the forum, and then I'll hand it off to our council chair and our Delta lead scientist to provide some welcoming remarks. Just wanted to mention before I transition that we welcome you to use the hashtag AMForum2021 to be part of the conversation on social media. So I'd like to start by telling you about the goals that the planning committee organized this forum around. We reflected on what was accomplished at the 2019 Adaptive Management Forum, which some of you may have attended, and we considered what we thought was the most important to focus on in the current environment. What we settled on were these four goals, synthesis, education, networking, and dialogue. In order to achieve these goals, we've invited presentations that we think synthesize information or share information that can be synthesized. We have designed sessions that we think illustrate how adaptive management is practiced or how data can be transformed into actionable knowledge. We've created spaces in the agenda for interactivity to facilitate networking, mutual learning, and co-production. And finally, we've tailored discussions, workshops, and other interactive spaces to foster dialogue around the concept and logistics of adaptive management. We'd like to kick off with a short assessment right now to get your perspectives on adaptive management. So get out your phone or open a browser window on your computer and go to menti.com and enter this code. 930301. There's going to be two prompts, and we're going to get to see the results of this in real time. So I'm just going to give everyone a minute to log on. Um, if you're joining us on the phone and can't see these slides, I'll just read it one more time. The website is menti, M E N T I, dot com, and you're going to enter the code 930301 and answer the prompts. All right, you should be able to see here, we've got results rolling in. Just getting a sense of where people land on a scale of um, what their understanding coming into the forum is of adaptive management, how it's, how it's used, what's required to do it for individual projects, what's required to do it on a landscape. These are all topics that we're going to be delving into during this forum. And our hope is that whatever your answer is now, that sometime during the forum, you'll be able to reflect on some of the topics that you either already know a lot about or that you feel like you're less confident in your knowledge about, and we can expand on that. We're gonna repeat this uh, assessment exercise again at the end of the forum. Looks like for the most part, people have gotten through this question. Few, few still rolling in. So I'm going to move to the next slide and just, oops, sorry. And this one is a more open-ended opportunity for you to provide some words on what you think adaptive management means for someone who's unfamiliar with the term, how you would explain it. Great, starting to see a few, a few responses, learning by doing, changing management based on prior results, management that is flexible and agile for changing conditions. I love this plan, implement the plan, monitor results, make changes based on results to the plan, repeat. 
the wheel that shows up in so many presentations. Yes, we're going to see that some more today. Plan, do, evaluate, and respond. Learning by experience or an excuse for mistakes. I think an opportunity for mistakes too. Changing course, structured decision making, applying the scientific method to natural resources management. Modifying management to meet project goals. An investigation with multiple iterations. Love that. Learning when to switch to plan B. Well, I'll keep giving you the opportunity to fill in more answers here. We really appreciate your input. It gives us a great sense to know where you're starting and um, and hopefully this is also something that can evolve over the course of this forum and so we give you exposure to more ideas. I'm gonna go back to the slideshow now, but you're welcome to stay on Menti if you're still typing out the answers to your questions. Um, we'll be using that in our closing uh, reflections, so appreciate you finishing the Menti exercise. So I just wanted to give um, a high level overview of the agenda. This is the at a glance schedule that's also featured on the first page of your workshop program. For your convenience, we've tagged sessions with icons so that you can get an overview of the flow. Indicated with the light bulbs, we have plenaries on the first and last day. This is where you'll hear about the big picture. In the opening plenary, we'll focus on the past, the foundations in law, policy, and practice that have brought us to where we are today. On the last day, the closing plenary will look into the future, focusing on the challenges associated with an uncertain climate and laying out a vision for the term of the new Delta lead scientist, Laurel Larson. We have two lightning talk sessions featuring speakers who are working on the ground to implement restoration or water management projects. We'll hear from people about incorporating adaptive management into project planning and about lessons learned from project implementation. We hope these five minute presentations will light your curiosities. At the end of each lightning session, in addition to live question and answer time with the speakers, we'll break you all up into groups for about 20 minutes of small group discussion. We hope this will be a nice opportunity to meet and mingle with some of the forum participants given this virtual format. A couple of our sessions will be standard length conference talks, 15 minute talks with individual questions and answers. Speakers in these sessions will share ideas and tools related to funding, modeling, monitoring, targeted research and synthesis to support adaptive management. Finally, in the afternoons, we'll be running concurrent workshops. Today, a workshop on Adaptive Management Planning 101, where participants will work in small groups to mock up some components of an adaptive management plan. Tomorrow, permitting for adaptive management success, where participants will hear from regulators about the nexus between adaptive management and their policies, and have the opportunity to discuss topics in small groups. Offered both days is a workshop on the recently developed Delta Landscapes Scenario Planning Tool, featuring an interactive tutorial on using the tool to evaluate different restoration scenarios. The landscape planning tool workshop is the same on both days, so you have two chances to catch it. You should have had the opportunity to register for workshops when you registered for the conference and will have received separate Teams links for those afternoon sessions. If you're not registered or would like to change your registration, please contact engage at deltacouncil.ca.gov and our staff will assist you. The last thing I'll mention is the virtual whiteboard, which is an interactive space for you to share reactions to presentations or workshops, ask questions, network, or generally exchange ideas about adaptive management. The board is hosted on a site called Mural. Where we're going to put the link in the chat and the board will be open until early next week. You should be able to access the board as a visitor without logging into Menti. Sorry, to, um, to Mural. We encourage you to explore and familiarize yourself as you're listening to presentations this morning and use the space to engage throughout the forum. We'll provide you with specific prompts and reminders throughout the forum. 
With that, um, I'll end my screen share and hand off the mic to Laurel Larson, our Delta lead scientist, uh, who has some opening remarks. Laurel, you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. I would like to add my voice to the chorus of welcomes that you'll hear this morning to the Adaptive Management Forum. Adaptive management is at the core of how to realize the vision of one delta, one science. It is by nature collaborative, system focused, and responsive to changing conditions, making it an ideal tool for dealing with the many challenges that make the delta a so-called wicked problem. It is also structured to maximally aid in decision making in the face of highly uncertain inputs and environmental conditions, which, as I'll discuss a little bit later this morning, characterize the future of California. Adaptive management formalizes the application of science to on the ground management. It is a structured, systematic approach to learning and knowledge integration. But adaptive management isn't just applied science. In practice, many pieces need to be in place and well coordinated to support adaptive management, including planning and permitting, monitoring systems and funding, to name a few. It also requires clear communication between scientists, managers and stakeholders and the establishment of trust. With respect to this communication, this adaptive management forum takes a big step in the right direction. One of the big questions that we face in the Delta is how to practice adaptive management, not only at the individual project scale, but also at a much larger landscape scale. In other words, how do we adaptively manage the dynamic socio-ecological system that is the Delta holistically with the objective of creating a resilient landscape in the face of major change? This is something that I do plan to speak at length about on Friday and a challenge that I want you all to keep at the forefront of your minds over these entire three days. So in short, adaptive management is complex and there are certainly challenges. This forum brings together scientists, managers, regulators, planners, and other stakeholders to explore our different roles in adaptive management and demonstrate creativity in addressing salient challenges. We encourage participants to use this event as an opportunity to listen and to learn, but also to converse and forge connections. Building a community around adaptive management will strengthen our ability to confront our shared challenges and implement adaptive management at the landscape scale. Last but not least, I would like to acknowledge that this forum is the product of around the clock work, work by the science based adaptive management unit led by Karen Kafetz and the multi agency planning committee. I would particularly like to applaud Chelsea Batavia for her fearless leadership in convening this meeting. So thank you, and I will turn the mic back over to Karen. Thank you, Laurel. We have uh, welcome remarks as well from our council chair, Susan Tatayan. Susan. Good morning, everyone. I'm glad to be with you today, and I'm honored to offer some opening comments at this forum. This forum is a landmark event in the Delta. It is the only forum dedicated to advancing our collective understanding of adaptive management and its benefits to the Delta region. As most of you know, adaptive management is an explicit charge of the Delta plan. The Delta Reform Act states the Delta plan shall include a science-based transparent and formal adaptive management strategy for ongoing ecosystem restoration and water management decisions. The act also specifies that the Delta Science Program shall coordinate with Delta agencies to promote science-based adaptive management. I'll note that our science program is going above and beyond to fulfill this charge. In light of global climate change and the ever-changing nature of the Delta's ecosystem, successful adaptive management is more important than ever. The Delta's Independent Science Board's journal article, Preparing for a Fast-Forward fast Future in the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta, states, as the effects of climate change gain force, the environment is changing more rapidly and extreme events, droughts, heat waves, forest fires, and floods are becoming more extreme. Ecosystems are being driven to or beyond thresholds of irreversible change. 
As these climate-driven changes compound with ongoing changes in land use and other drivers, uncertainty increases. So as we grapple with climate change and rapidly changing conditions in the Delta, we must be equipped to learn and adapt more quickly if we are to achieve the state's co-equal goals. On the other hand, creating an adaptive management plan is a demanding time-consuming process that requires collaboration among scientists, managers, decision makers, and stakeholders. And carrying out an adaptive management plan tends to be a slow process. So this dilemma leads me to many questions. I'll share just a few here. One, what constitutes a successful adaptive management program? Two, are there ways to carry out the nine-step adaptive management cycle more quickly without giving up what's best in the process? Three, are there tools available for concisely communicating the benefits of adaptive management to overburdened leaders and policymakers? I'll be listening for answers to these questions and more during the forum. Uh, I'll close by saying the caliber, diversity, and number of participants and presenters at this forum give me hope that we will find ingenious ways to confront increasingly rapid change in the Delta and integrate our adaptive management actions. Thank you for your interest and your efforts in advancing our collective understanding of adaptive management and its benefits and challenges. Back to you, Karen. Thank you, Susan. What beautiful words. Really appreciate it. So we're going to kick off our plenary session now. Um, as I mentioned in my overview, this plenary is really about looking back into the past, see how adaptive management has evolved in the Sacramento-San Joaquin Bay, Bay Delta region from before it was a mandate in the Delta Reform Act to today. We're gonna emphasize lessons learned and pieces of history that remain relevant to adaptive management now and in the future. This session will end with a panel Q&A, so we'll hold off on doing individual questions for each speaker and invite all three of our speakers um, to participate in the panel at the end. So when that panel comes up, you can put questions in the chat, you can raise your hand, um, but we'll all take questions together. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first plenary speaker, Phil Eisenberg. Phil Eisenberg is the founding chair of the Delta Stewardship Council. Across his long career in state and local government, Mr. Eisenberg has served in numerous roles, including Sacramento City Council member, mayor of Sacramento, member of the California Assembly. As an elected official, he focused on land use planning, water and resource issues, state budget and fiscal matters, redevelopment reform, and health care. More recently, Mr. Eisenberg served as the chair of the Delta Vision Blue Ribbon Task Force, which provided much of the structure for the major changes in water and Delta policy enacted with the 2009 Delta Reform Act. Welcome, Phil. So Phil is on the phone. He might need to hit star six to unmute himself. On the phone. Yep, there you go. Yep, Phil, okay, can you hear On the phone. Yep. Uh, apologies, I'm not on uh, any video so you can see me, uh, but thank you very much for inviting me. I'd like to uh, uh, thank Susan to tie in for uh, uh, being a terrific chair and more importantly, uh, actually pointing out some of the dilemmas of the conference today. And secondly, and maybe more important, uh, I feel somewhat guilty going first because Mike Healy, the very next speaker, is in fact uh, about the only person I know who you would call uh, father of the notion of adaptive management and Delta going far back beyond my uh, tenure. But in any event, uh, I view this as a public policy issue and not a technical issue. And my general impression is that for all the other victories that the uh, 
Delta Stewardship Council has accomplished. The one that's kind of lagging behind uh, is more amorphous than it should be is adaptive management. That may, may be the very nature of its business since uh, uh, you're talking about things that will happen in the future. But let me just uh, emphasize some of the points Susan did and some additional things. Uh, the legislature mandated the development of a legally enforceable Delta plan and legally enforceable elements of that plan that relate to science. Uh, that's fundamentally important. And as folks who are doing the hands-on work on adaptive management, you ought to consciously and deliberately spend your time thinking of ways to include within the mandatory provisions of the Delta plan, whatever it is that you want to do with adaptive management. Secondly, the council was, uh, uh, was uh, equally uh, and surprisingly, in my view, uh, given the authority to develop the Delta plan and the legislature explicitly adopted our so-called co-equal goals, improve the Delta and make, more uh, make, make water more reliable for California without specifying uh, who's included in that puzzle. That's important because it's the first statutory declaration that attempted to give a balance to both ecosystem and water use uh, 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 dependent on the Delta. That gives, as part of an enforceable Delta plan, an additional clout to environmental stuff. Footnote, I think adaptive management spends too much of its time on ecosystem stuff because that's where it gets a friendly reception and not enough yet on water development and major water facility projects, which is where the vast public controversies exist. Uh, the legislature also gave all of us uh, some excellent mandatory advice when he sa they said the policy of the state of California is to reduce reliance on the Delta in meeting California's future water supply needs. And then listed a bunch of environmentally conscious provisions that are part of it. Again, part of an enforceable Delta plan, not unlimited. It has to touch the Delta or uh, people consume water from the Delta to make it happen. But as Susan mentioned, uh, the Delta Independent Science Board was created, took over the responsibilities from, uh, for a similar activity uh, uh, at CalFed. The Delta Science Program was created by statute and a Delta lead scientist was adopted. Uh, ingredients that were included, again, Susan mentioned uh, uh, this, best available science, whatever in the Dickens that means, uh, is part and mandated part of the legally enforceable Delta plan. Uh, my own experience is that scientists are generally reluctant to uh, say what's the best of it. Available science, but they spend a lot of time at least talking about it and it's become more real. The adaptive management part, it seems to me, is still a puzzle. Uh, most of the other elements have, in, in the Delta plan and for the council have been resolved through endless litigation, a lot of political battles, uh, and some creative staff work, including the fact that in 2018, uh, the uh, Delta Stewardship Council staff uh, was uh, required to review uh, what we uh, called water fix. That's uh, Jerry Brown's last version of his Delta tunnels. And uh, DWR, uh, which, is, which had immense problems with it, including funders dropping out and so on, was struggling. And they decided to kind of clear the groundwork by saying, well, we think it's all consistent with the Delta plan, whatever it is, uh, but uh, that triggered the review. And by, I think it was November of 2018, the staff put out a report saying, sorry, you're not in compliance. And at that point, the Department of Water Resources, grumping all the way, 
withdrew the proposal. Uh, that turned out to be the nail in the coffin of water fix. And now we're with uh, Governor Newsom's version of it. But the point I want to make is that process, litigation, mandatory requirements, system reviews, all carry clout. And that clout is helped by fighting and winning through on battles. And I think that's one of the problems and one of the advantages, uh, I'm sorry, one of the opportunities that adaptive management has to make. Um, just a few last points to you. Uh, I've always viewed adaptive management as kind of fuzzy. Uh, it requires, as, as do all uh, processes that, uh, that uh, uh, are required to be done, it requires clear and measurable outcomes. But we tend to focus on the process. Have we had hearings? Have we consulted with people and so on? And we haven't really nailed down the adaptive management outcomes that we want to see. And more precisely, I don't think there has yet been litigation to stop a, pro a water development project because of the insufficiency of their adaptive management. And until that happens, it's going to be awfully hard to figure out how to do adaptive management without it just simply being left for co endless conversations between scientists, occasional government lawyers, interest groups, and not being publicly understandable at all. Anyway, uh, I learned a whole ton of stuff by going through this process uh, at the Delta Stewardship Council. And for a couple of years in advance uh, in the Dell Division Blue Ribbon Task Force, where, by the way, Mike Healy was the lead scientist, one of the co-equal lead, one of the co-lead uh, scientists in that process also. So I've learned more from Mike than he may appreciate. And I've learned that unless you figure ways to make actions actually happen, as opposed to being talked about, uh, adaptive management's uh, going to eventually kind of bleed off into something that isn't as important as it has to be. And after all, the most important thing in, in policy making and in uh, government is not thinking up what to do and not passing laws or imposing regulations. It's, it's figuring out how real people on the ground behave. And if you can't change human behavior, uh, you're not gonna get any good results. Anyway, an op a, a real honor to participate in the panel today. Thank you. Thank you, Phil, for reminding us how important it is to do adaptive management, not only when it is welcome, but when it is hard. Also for bringing us back to thinking about how projects that change the landscape or change our water management practices affect people and how we can use adaptive management to navigate controversial projects. You also provided a solemn reminder that even with legislation, without litigation, we may not truly have the teeth to enforce the use of adaptive management approach. Thanks, Phil. Looking forward to having you on the panel. I'm gonna introduce our next speaker, Dr. Mike Healy is a professor emeritus at the University of British Columbia, where his research focuses on the ecology and life history of Pacific salmon. Dr. Healy has also worked extensively to advance the application of science in water resources and fisheries management. Among these efforts, from 2004 to 2006, he served as a member of the Delta Independent Science Board, contributing his expertise as the board established its role providing scientific oversight in the Delta. In 2007 and 2008, he was lead scientist for the Delta Science Program. And in 2007, he served as science advisor to the Delta Vision Task Force. More recently, in his retirement, he has directed his energy towards raising awareness on the implications of climate change for society and the environment. Welcome, Mike. Well, thanks very, very much, Karen. I, now I guess I have to see whether or not I can uh, link to my PowerPoint.
Oh my goodness, it seems to have worked. Can everybody see that? Yeah. Okay, well, uh, thanks Karen for that uh, uh, generous introduction. And I also want to thank the organizers for inviting me to talk about adaptive management and one of my favorite subjects still after all these years. And also it's uh, really nice to be back in California again, if only virtually. So this is uh, going to be a talk about the history of adaptive management in the early days of CalFed and uh, into the uh, early days of the Delta Stewardship Council. It all started in 1995 when I joined the newly created Science Advisory Board of the CalFed Ecosystem Restoration Program. CalFed is charged with using something called adaptive management in, uh, to design and implement its water and environmental management program. When I joined uh, the Science Advisory Board, the uh, program was struggling with this requirement because uh, no one really knew what adaptive management was. I'd worked with uh, key people responsible for adaptive management, uh, Crawford, Buzz Halling, and Carl Walters at UBC, and so I was able to shed, to shed light on what adaptive management was and how it might be incorporated into CalFed. So today I want to review briefly uh, the history of adaptive management in CalFed and into the early days of the Delta Stewardship Council. Here are the things that I want to cover. I want to talk about the origins of adaptive management, which is really about using decision theory, systems theory, and some other uh, relatively new techniques to make better management decisions. But mostly I want to focus on Buzz Hollings' vision of how adaptive management would be employed. <clears throat> then I'll talk very briefly about adaptive management in major US environmental programs starting in the 1980s. Then we get into adaptive management in CalFed uh, and uh, how it got uh, described and incorporated through the strategic planning team. Talk a bit about some of the obstacles to implementing adaptive management in the Delta and a few of the examples that were initiated under the CalFed program. Then of course we, uh, CalFed fell out of favor and so we were looking at a new governance system and uh, so I'll talk a bit about adaptive management in the context of the Blue Ribbon Task Force and the Delta Plan. And finally, I'll say something about what I think has been gained from incorporating adaptive management into water and environmental management in the Delta. And uh, in that process, maybe try to answer a bit uh, Bill's question about uh, how do you know when you've succeeded with adaptive management? So what were the foundations of adaptive management? It, uh, in the 1960s and 1970s, a new set of technologies was coming into play in environmental science and business. There were concepts borrowed from engineering, like systems analysis and optimal control theory. Concepts that were borrowed from economics and psychology, like decision theory and structured approaches to decision making. And new uh, uh, concepts in computer science, like systems analysis and dynamic programming. A new generation of professionals wanted to use these new technologies to make better decisions in business and better decisions in resource and environmental management. Buzz Halling was one of those professionals, and together with his colleague Carl Walters at the Institute for Animal Resource Ecology at the University of British Columbia, Buzz began to formulate the ideas that led to adaptive management. In 1977, uh, Buzz and Carl went off to the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis in Austria to consolidate their ideas. Uh, and there, with input from some like-minded colleagues from various places around the world, they produced the foundational book on adaptive management, Adaptive Environmental Assessment and Management. It was published by the Institute in 1978. The first section of this book lays out the intellectual and technical framework of adaptive management. The second half is devoted to how adaptive management could be applied in four case studies. The management of spruce budworm outbreaks in the forests of New Brunswick, the management of salmon fisheries on the Pacific coast of North America, land use planning for the uh, resort area of Obergurgel in Austria, and decisions about design 
construction of dams in uh, Venezuela. After a number of years of working with resource management agencies trying to implement adaptive management, Carl wrote his own book on adaptive management, Carl Walters, Adaptive Management of Renewable Resources. This is a much more technical book than Hollings and is more frightening for the non-mathematician, but nevertheless, this is a book full of critical information about adaptive management. I'd be really interested to know how many of you in the audience who are working in adaptive management have read one or both these books. Neither is referenced in the adaptive management section of the Delta Plan, but these are the foundational books on the subject of adaptive management, and in my view, they should be on the shelves of everyone who's working in adaptive management. Hollings' book, Adaptive Environmental Assessment and Management, laid out what he saw as the process for applying adaptive management. He envisioned a small team of adaptive management specialists who would lead the process. They would start by engaging with decision makers to do a preliminary scoping of the problem. <clears throat> then the adaptive management team would convene a workshop with decision makers, specialists, and affected citizens to clarify exactly what was the problem they were going to address, talk about the available information for dealing with the problem, the major uncertainties, and what the management options might be. <clears throat> During this workshop, maybe over lunch, if it was a one-day workshop or in the evening, if it was a two-day workshop, the adaptive management team would draft an initial version of the system model that they would use to explore how to manage uh, or how to deal with the problem. After, after, at the close, uh, when, they, when they reconvened, they would uh, go over the, this uh, draft model with uh, the participants in the workshop and uh, discuss uh, how it might be applied and work out any difficulties that people saw with the model. The end of the workshop, the adaptive management team would work with specialists, scientists, economists, sociologists to clarify policy options and the model. Then they convene a second workshop to share preliminary results and make further adjustments to the model. As you can see, Holly's view was that this is a highly collaborative process. Uh, the model was central to the whole process. And these workshops were designed not only to share information, uh, but also to get all of the participants uh, comfortable with the model as a tool for exploring how to manage the system they were concerned about. After the second workshop, uh, the, uh, which they would again further discuss the model and make any necessary adjustments, uh, talk about what uncertainties remained and how to address those, uh, the adaptive management team would update the model and the policy options, and then use the model to test policy outcomes and report the results of all the list of the decision makers. So in, at this stage, they would begin to get uh, some of the things that uh, uh, Phil was talking about, in particular, uh, what they expected the results of management to be. After this discussion, the decision makers would choose their preferred policies, and then the adaptive management team uh, would work with the implementing agencies to design implementation and monitoring for uh, addressing the problems that uh, they had been discussing. After this, the agencies would implement their aspects of the program with coordination by the adaptive management team. And as information started to come in from the uh, application of the management program, uh, because monitoring was a big part of this, uh, the adaptive management team and the agency staff would use those data to evaluate the effects of the program, report to the decision makers, and recommend any program modification. I think the important thing to take from this are two things. One is that the hauling saw adaptive management was very much built around a uh, numerical model of the system that could be used uh, to game uh, policy options and explore management outcomes. And secondly, uh, that it was a highly collaborative process uh, so that everyone was engaged and everyone understood what was going on. And this included uh, the public representatives who were interested in the, in the outcome uh, so that there was no mystery about what was being done and why it was being done. Well, in uh, the 1980s and 90s, for some reason uh, that I have not yet been able to discover, uh, adaptive management became very popular in the United States. And uh, the resource agencies and the federal government were all pretty much tasked with using adaptive management in carrying out their mandates. As a result, we had a whole bunch of uh, 
large scale environmental projects started during that period uh, that employed uh, and were charged with employing adaptive management. There's just a short list of some of the ones here that involved water. There was uh, salmon restoration on the Columbia River, which was initiated in 1984 and is ongoing. Habitat mitigation in the Missouri River, which was authorized in 1986 and is ongoing. A restoration of the Kissimmee River, authorized in 1992 and ongoing. The Colorado River Glen Canyon Adaptive Management Program, which is initiated in 1995 and is ongoing. And in California, CalFed, uh, through to the Delta Reform Act, initiated in 1994 and ongoing. And there were lots of other water ones, Upper Mississippi, Everglades, coastal Louisiana, and also in the land-based agencies, uh, forestry and agriculture were also employing adaptive management. So you can look through the literature and reports and find all sorts of examples of how uh, different government agencies employed adaptive management. And something that's really interesting is that adaptive management evolved in a different way in each of these projects, and hardly any of them uh, unfolded in the way that Holling envisioned. Well, in CalFed, there were a number of antecedents to uh, uh, getting adapt. Uh, I should say in the Bay Delta, there were a number of antecedents, both to the CalFed Bay Delta program and to the implementation of adaptive management. I don't have to tell any of you that water management in California has always been contentious. And lots of user groups who want water who are all competing to get a bigger share of the resource. And in these conflicts, environmental consequences were generally secondary until uh, the 1992 Central Valley Project Improvement Act was, public, was passed. And that act required that fish and wildlife values be given equal consideration with other uh, uses of water. And so, uh, lots of things had to change. And the first thing that came out of this was the anatomous fish restoration program. But then in 1994, uh, just as the anatomous fish restoration program was uh, beginning to be implemented, uh, government agencies, water users, and environmental groups agreed on an approach to water and environmental management in California called the 1994 Bay Delta Accord. And out of the Bay Delta Accord came CalFed to be a coordinating agency to carry forward the goals of the Bay Delta Accord using adaptive management. So at least my understanding is that adaptive management was specifically mandated for the CalFed program. As I mentioned, uh, well, this is about the time that, that I joined the, the Ecosystem Restoration Program uh, Science Advisory Team. and um, found out that, that they had to apply adaptive management, but that uh, uh, nobody who was involved really understood what adaptive management was. So with advice from the uh, uh, an external advisory group, the uh, Ecosystem Restoration Program uh, created a strategic planning team to uh, provide a strategic plan for ecosystem restoration. And that uh, planning core team included myself, Wim Kimmerer, Matt Condolph, Peter Moyle, Roderick Mead, and Bob Twiss. And we met several times over about a four month period uh, to hash out a strategic plan for ecosystem restoration in the Sacramento and within the CalFed ambit uh, that was built around. Uh, an adaptive management framework. The uh, plan, the strategic plan produced by the core team included a, a detailed description of the process of adaptive management that was drawn from Hollings and Walters seminal works. And uh, the plan produced by the core team was incorporated uh, virtually unchanged into the Ecosystem Restoration Program Strategic Plan, which is illustrated here, which was published in 2000. And the adaptive management process that's described in that plan has been carried forward through successive CalFed and Delta Science Program documents. So it hasn't changed a great deal over that uh, couple of decades since it was first uh, put forward within the Ecosystem Restoration Program. 
Uh, this is the conceptual model, a flowchart for adaptive management uh, that uh, is, is abstracted from the strategic plan. The key points are that it begins with a clear specification of what the problem is you're going to tackle. And although that sounds simple, it's often not as easy as it sounds. Uh, it includes a clear set of goals and objectives, that is what is to be achieved. Uh, as uh, Phil was saying, you have, to, uh, you have to identify what it is you're trying to accomplish uh, so you can measure progress. And I think uh, Yogi Berra maybe said it best, if you don't know where you're going, you have to be careful because you might not get there. Uh, a conceptual model includes a, also a conceptual model of how the system to be managed functions so that a qualitative assessment of how the management will lead to particular outcomes can be examined. Uh, You'll remember from the description of Hollings' uh, uh, expectations for adaptive management that it's centered around a numerical model uh, that would be used to explore and game uh, policy outcomes. But when we talked about this uh, and with the uh, uh, agency people in the ecosystem restoration program uh, and in the core team, we were assured that there really wasn't the expertise in, in the agencies or in the people that they had for their consultants to actually uh, build the kind of conceptual models that uh, the kind of numerical models that uh, Alling envisioned. And so we uh, settled on using conceptual models as a basis for at least making some preliminary assessment of how <clears throat> um, different management policies might unfold. Then the policy would be implemented. Uh, there would be monitoring uh, of uh, the system as the policy was implemented to determine how it was responding and those monitoring data would be used uh, to assess whether or not the management program was working. And uh, depending on that assessment, there were uh, various pathways. If things were going well, you just continue the policy. Uh, if things weren't going well, you might uh, reassess the model to see if you could improve things by having a better model. Uh, you might set new goals, or you might have to completely rethink what the problem was you were working on. So, uh, some of this was pretty familiar to uh, resource management agencies, but some of it was not common practice. Uh, one of those things was developing even these conceptual models, uh, so that was something that we needed to work on. Uh, to my surprise, when we were talking about uh, this process, I found out that <clears throat> it wasn't common for, well, uh, wasn't, not only wasn't it not common for agencies to monitor the uh, managed systems, very much, or at least not in a formal way, but um, many of the funding sources uh, for implementing management programs specifically said those uh, funds could not be used for monitoring. And this uh, whole big box on the left-hand side, the assessing and evaluating and, and rethinking the process, uh, was generally not a formal part of the management planning. Uh, so there was a whole lot in here that was uh, pretty new and not part of the uh, typical approach to environmental management in California at the time. And so uh, we were assured that this was going to be a pretty hard sell with the management agencies. Now, I don't mean any disrespect to the uh, management agencies and the people involved for this in the state and federal agencies. It's turned out that adaptive management is a pretty hard sell everywhere, and there are a number of reasons for that. Here are some of the ones why it was uh, difficult in California. First of all, there was no agency experience with adaptive management. It was a new process and a lot of it was uh, not uh, things that they routinely did. Uh, agencies, of course, over time have worked out their own way, their own approach to doing a resource and environmental management and adaptive management didn't fit very well with that process. Uh, secondly, there was no local expertise trained in adaptive management. So there were no experts uh, locally that the agencies could turn to for help and advice. As I mentioned, a number of the elements of adaptive management, collaborative approach to problem definition, numerical models to gain policy outcomes, using management to generate information, monitoring to assess management, and lots of others who were pretty foreign to agency staff and decision makers. And so, uh, and of course, these things cost money, so it wasn't that easy to incorporate 
uh, these kinds of elements into the management process. So the common de definition of adaptive management, and, and we, we heard that uh, when people were uh, saying what they thought adaptive management was in the, in the uh, little survey, learning while doing, it's allowed agencies to believe there really wasn't anything new in adaptive management. After all, that's how we all proceed, right? We learn while we're doing things. Even though we may think we know what's happening, we keep tabs on what we do, and if things don't go well, we learn from that. And also, uh, at least my experience of working with government agencies, they have a tendency to redefine a new approach as what it already does. There are lots of reasons for this. Uh, one is that they're often told to do something new without receiving any new resources to do that. And so the easiest solution is to redefine what you've been told to do as part of what you're already doing. Uh, another problem, which I've already mentioned, was that funding in some cases could not be used for monitoring, and monitoring is central to adaptive management. And the last thing in the early days, which was also a big obstacle to getting adaptive management underway, was that CalFed had a lot of money that had to be spent quickly. So there really wasn't any time to inform and train or build consensus about adaptive management. So not surprisingly, the implementation of adaptive management was somewhat haphazard. Nevertheless, uh, quite a number of adaptive management projects uh, got underway during CalFed, primarily in the tributaries uh, uh, upstream because uh, at that time, uh, conservation of uh, Chinook and Steelhead was uh, uh, first priority, although things did get underway in the Delta as well. So some of the adaptive management projects that were initiated uh, in the early days of CalFed were uh, flow and habitat restoration for Chinook and Clear Creek, flow and habitat restoration for Chinook and rationalization of the Coleman Hatchery and Battle Creek, flow and habitat restoration for Chinook salmon in the Merced River, and a similar program on the Tuolumne. In the Delta, we had wetland restoration uh, of Dutch slough and also uh, wetland and habitat restoration in places like McCormick, Williamson Track, Liberty Island, and others. And then there was the Vinalis Adaptive Management Program looking at how uh, the effects of flow and old river barrier on uh, survival of uh, Chinook smolts coming out of the San Joaquin system. So a lot of things were initiated uh, in the early days of CalFed, uh, but the fact was that many of those never got much past the planning stage. Um, and I think some of them are, are still sort of sitting in the planning stage, uh, which comes back to a, a issue that, uh, um, again, that Phil raised is, you know, you have to get on with it. You can't just endlessly plan. And in fact, uh, one of the uh, purposes of adaptive management was to help you get past that uh, planning stage. Uh, if adaptive management is done as anticipated, then you uh, shouldn't take more than a few weeks to get to the point where you could actually start implementing management. But, of course, it requires courage to take those uh, management decisions. And if there are other obstacles, <laughs> as there are in California, you know, acquiring land, getting permits, uh, and all of those regulatory things, then uh, some things just have a great struggle to get underway. Now, some of these projects were really only loosely connected with adaptive management, but that's okay. You have to learn while doing, right? Some of them follow the script quite well, such as the Clear Creek uh, restoration project. And I think uh, to a degree that was because they were able to employ consultants who understood adaptive management and could help them make progress. And uh, I have to say the problems of implementing adaptive management in CalFed also carried over into the early days of the Stewardship Council. In confronting the difficulties of implementing adaptive management, uh, uh, as happened in all of these other major projects, CalFed began to develop its own version of adaptive management. Given the institutional and expertise constraints within the state and federal agencies who are re responsible for implementing adaptive management, uh, the CalFed adaptive management model seemed to me to be not too bad a compromise. So here's a diagram of the uh, adaptive management uh, CalFed version. And you can see it looks a lot like the adaptive management flow chart that I showed you earlier. Um, there are some important differences, though. Um, first of all, 
uh, the version maintains a traditional separation between science, uh, management, uh, retain the responsibility for the operational implementation of um, management programs. Uh, while science was charged with dealing with uh, uncertainties and complexities through things like targeted research and pilot projects to prove concepts, uh, there was collaboration, but uh, it wasn't the uh, one big happy collaborating family that uh, Hauling had, had envisioned. Uh, the, as, as always, the preferred management uh, pathway was to uh, define the problem, uh, consider the management options, uh, choose one and implement it, uh, and then uh, assume that it was going to have the kind of positive outcomes that everybody anticipated. Um, the CalFed model, of course, includes pretty uh, close attention to monitoring. So uh, in the CalFed model, there is uh, definitely the uh, possibility of early on discovering that the management uh, plan is not working as well as you'd hoped, and so you could take corrective action, either through uh, redefining the management options or uh, redefining the problem. Um, but I actually, I was when, when this started to uh, develop, I was uh, fairly happy because I thought this captured most of the critical elements of adaptive management, even if it wasn't exactly in the format that Hauling anticipated. Well, when the uh, CalFed structure a loss to support of the participating agencies and outside interests. Uh, the problems that CalFed had been created to address, uh, of course, didn't go away. So in 2007, Governor Schwarzenegger appointed a Blue Ribbon Task Force to develop a new vision for water and environmental management in the Delta. That's where I first met Phil. The focus was the Delta. Uh, CalFed had looked at the whole watersheds plus out into the ocean, but now we were going to focus on the Delta leaving issues upstream and downstream to be handled by the relevant state and federal agencies. Uh, the report of the Blue Ribbon Task Force specified that a healthy Delta ecosystem and a reliable water supply should be the co-equal goals of managing the Delta. In addition, management had to be cognizant of the importance of the Delta as a place where people lived, worked, and played. The Delta Vision document made 12 specific recommendations that were codified in the 2009 Delta Reform Act. And as you've already heard, this act specifically requires that adaptive management be the management framework for achieving the co-equal goals. Uh, out of this whole process, we got the Delta Plan, which was released in 2013, and it lays out how the co-equal goals will be achieved and how adaptive management will inform the management of the Delta. The adaptive management cycle described in the Delta plan is virtually the same one that was presented in the Ecosystem Restoration Program Strategic Plan, although the design is definitely a lot sexier. I have to say it's gratifying to me at least that uh, CalFed has held on to the original concept of adaptive management and continues to try to implement it. However, uh, one thing that I thought was a serious omission from the Delta Plan is that neither Hollings nor Walters books is referenced in the Delta Plan. So we're beavering away here trying to do adaptive management in the Delta and uh, Bill and others have raised the question, you know, uh, what will we, <laughs> how will we know if it's working? How will we know if it's a success? And I think there are some specific expected products of adaptive management uh, that uh, might make it worthwhile, uh, but really the decision about whether or not adaptive management is worth the time and trouble uh, must rest with the agencies charged with implementing it. Um, but the expected products that I think should come from adaptive management are, first of all, a clear specification of the problem, the management options, and the expected outcomes that everybody understands and everybody generally agrees with. So, secondly, a model, preferably a numerical model, will, will allow managers to explore the consequences of management interventions. And again, this should be a model built in collaboration with all of the interested parties so that everybody understands the model uh, 
what it's expected to do, and agrees with it being a useful tool. Third thing is improved understanding of how the system functions. A, a big purpose of adaptive management is that the management interventions be designed to generate information about how the system works so that uh, knowledge and understanding is a product of management as well as a stimulus for management. Fourth, a more collaborative understanding among all of the uh, agencies and individuals involved, more collaborative understanding of the system among scientists, managers, decision makers, and the public. Definitely a way of using the monitoring data to update management, learning while doing. Uh, there should be a clear pathway from information gathered as a result of implementing a management program uh, through to the whole reconsideration and evaluation of the program overall. And lastly, most importantly, more effective management. If you aren't getting number six, then the rest of it, uh, however interesting it may be, uh, hardly seems worthwhile. So a few conclusions. Uh, adaptive management provides a structured, rational framework for theory and practice of resource management. It's a fully consistent system. But despite its attractiveness in theory, very few management agencies have incorporated adaptive management into their standard procedures. Uh, I mentioned earlier on that there are an awful lot of programs that were initiated employing adaptive management in the 1980s and 1990s. <clears throat> uh, adaptive management survives uh, in a recognizable form in rather few of those. And uh, the Bay Delta system is one of the few where adaptive management uh, is still being practiced. So I, I salute you for that. But of course, you're required by law to use adaptive management as the organizing framework for ecosystem management. However, there would be lots of ways around that if you didn't want to do it. And during the time that I was involved in the Delta, primarily from 1995 to 2009, many, many elements of adaptive management were incorporated into environmental management. And I would guess that new people joining the agencies uh, would have no clue as to how things were done in the command and call process, control process of 20 years ago. And finally, as I've already mentioned, whether or not this has improved environmental management remains a subject of debate, and it's really up to those engaged in the practice uh, to answer that question. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mike. I'm so glad you were able to join us virtually in California this morning. I've been working in the Bay Delta for about 15 years, and I still feel like I'm the new kid on the block sometimes. So I count myself as one of the many people on the call today who benefit from learning more about the deep history of science-based management in the Delta. Also say, you know, as Susan said in her opening remarks, one of the charges of the Delta Science Program is to promote the use of science-based adaptive management and I've been working at the science program on adaptive management for about six years now. But even just in that short time, I've noticed a great shift in how much we've had to promote adaptive management as a set of foreign concepts like you were outlining. Um, I feel like now our job is less about getting overall buy-in and much more about providing advice and tools to help projects do the best job that they can do with adaptive management. So it does represent a, a huge shift um, from you know where where you outlined we came from twenty years ago. Yeah, so. I agree, and, and that makes you uh, the adaptive management team. So get on with it. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Um, I'm going to introduce our last speaker of the plenary session this morning. You've already heard from her for for a quick second, and you'll hear from her again in our closing plenary on Friday. Uh, Dr. Laurel Larson is the Delta lead scientist and an associate professor in the departments of geography and civil and environmental engineering at UC Berkeley. Um, Laurel. Thank you, Karen. I'm just going to share my screen here. Okay. So I was asked to close out this session by glimpsing ahead briefly to an uncertain future. So first, on uncertainty, uncertainty is a necessary prerequisite for adaptive management being an effective strategy, as indicated in this graphic prepared by the Independent Science Board. 
So it's no stranger to this audience. And as you may be aware, after years of fire, flood, mudslides, heat, and drought, the only thing that is certain about California's future is that it will bring increasing levels of uncertainty. Climate models predict statistically significant increases in the frequency of wet extremes relative to pre-industrial levels before we are halfway through with this century, and likely but not as certain increases in the frequency of dry extremes. At the end of the last drought, Daniel Swain, now at UCLA, popularized the term weather whiplash, which refers to the back-to-back -back occurrence of dry extremes and wet extremes, which in turn creates storage challenges and conditions ripe for the occurrence of disastrous wildfires. These whiplash events likewise are projected to likely increase in frequency. Now, this increasing frequency of hydrologic extremes and whiplash events, together with the incomplete understanding of the processes that would need to go into creating forecasts of specific events, create grave challenges for water and ecosystem management. Many water management decisions are based on historical averages obtained from decades with fewer extremes and often do not consider the possibility of opposite extremes in the next water year. Now, on top of the increase in climate variability, we are also faced with the challenges of increases in mean temperature, sea level, and possibly annual precipitation totals, as summarized in the recent climate vulnerability assessment just released for public comment by the Delta ADAPTS program within the Delta Stewardship Council. Not shown here, but equally important is the change in the form of precipitation, replacing rain with snow in the Sierras, and the timing of that precipitation, which will result in more delivery of water year totals to the Delta during the wet season, when it is difficult to capture in storage and less delivery during the dry season. As reported in the vulnerability assessment, these changes will contribute to a host of socio-ecological challenges throughout the whole Delta system. One thing I would particularly like to point out is that while, while we often focus on the altered temporal sequencing of climate inputs as a major challenge for management, spatial heterogeneity, as exemplified here by spatial heterogeneity and social vulnerability, adds an additional layer of complexity. In thinking about management strategies for adaptation and system-wide resilience, a one-size-fits-all approach is simply not going to cut it here. Now, I don't wanna leave this talk on a Debbie Downer note. I feel compelled to point out some good news as well, starting with the flip side of the management challenges posed by spatial heterogeneity, or in other words, opportunities. One is that because this is not a static landscape, attributes that we value within the Delta may have some freedom to move around within the Delta in response to these stressors without being lost, which is only a possibility because of the heterogeneity of our system. Heterogeneity of elevations, for example, while slight, may be conducive to some ecosystems moving to slightly higher ground in the face of sea level rise. Because urban development and engineering hardscape are not as prevalent in the Delta as in the Bay, this may be an asset that we could strategically use to a greater extent here than our counterpart planners with, uh, within the Bay. Second, in creating inundation maps, we tend to neglect that tidal wetlands are natural buffers against sea level rise, responding by accreting to higher ground. This arises as a feedback between water levels, vegetation productivity and decomposition rates, and vegetation's sediment trapping capability. Though not all tidal wetlands can keep up with sea level rise, particularly if sediment supply is not sufficient, this is a landscape feature that should not be given short shrift in system-wide adaptive management. Finally, there has been a lot of attention among terrestrial ecologists in California given to the concept of climate refugia. The basic concept is that because of microclimates, varied, varied topography and other geographic elements and local hydrology that, for example, creates local areas of groundwater discharge, not all locations within a landscape will change to an equal extent in response to climate change. In fact, some areas may not exhibit much change in habitat characteristics at all, while others may change only at very advanced stages of climate change. These areas serve as local refugia for species present within a region and may allow them to endure for longer periods of time. Though there has been considerable effort recently invested in mapping refugia for terrestrial vegetation statewide, I am unaware of similar efforts to map thermal or hydrologic refugia within the Delta. Such an effort could fit very nicely into an adaptive management cycle 
that considers landscape scale adaptive management needs. In fact, all of the challenges and opportunities created by temporal uncertainty and spatial heterogeneity would benefit from a landscape scale perspective. Moving towards this landscape scale perspective is a key challenge that I would like to task this group with addressing in your discussions and ongoing work. So I will end this talk here and look forward to participating in the panel. Thank you so much, Laurel. So I'm going to say thanks again to Phil, Mike and Laurel. It's been a thought provoking conversation so far. Um, I would like to invite you all, uh, you three, to turn on your cameras um, for the panel discussion. Phil, I know you're just on the phone, so if you can right. um, press star six to make sure that you're unmuted, please. I, I think um, I'm unmuted. You are. We can hear you. Thanks, Phil. Uh, participants, if you have a question for one or more of our plenary speakers, you can Put your comment in the chat or you can use the raise hand function to get in the queue. Um, I noticed we already had a couple of comments in the chat. Denise Reed, would you like to put yourself off mute and, and turn your camera on? And um, you had a question for Mike. Yeah, so Mike, uh, thanks. It was a great presentation. So um, uh, questions in the chat, but it's really about you made the point that early in the process, um, there was resistance to spending time on developing numerical models um, as the, the kind of uh, original approach might have been, been based on and whether or not that was lack of resources or lack of expertise or whatever. Do you think that how much of a hindrance do you think that has been? Um, we have this idea of um, this idea of having an expected an agreed upon expected outcome for the project going in being important to adaptive management. I wonder how without numerical tools and quantitative predictions, uh, is that does that really um, limit our success fundamentally here? Uh, <clears throat> uh, I think in a, to, to an extent it does. Uh, I, I, I really felt uh, during my time here that it was really critical to at least get the uh, Conceptual models worked out, and you were involved in that too uh, in, in the uh, GRIP program. And this was not an easy task to do, even just to get the conceptual models pinned down. And it was even harder to get them uh, assembled somewhere and looked at from time to time so they could be updated. Uh, so I think it really would have been virtually impossible to uh, pursue a Hollings numerical model approach. Um, but even getting the conceptual models out and having some agreement on those, I think, was a was a big step forward. But it is still a hindrance to uh, doing any kind of gaming with policies to determine what the uh, consequences of a particular management action might be. So, you know, I'd like to see CalFed, not CalFed, but the, the science program and the um, adaptive management program try to evolve towards those numerical models. Uh, Again, part of the problem was, and I, I had this problem discussing it with my uh, uh, cohorts on the core team when we were writing a strategic planning document. Uh, they didn't really understand the uh, nature of the numerical models that Hollings Group was talking about. Uh, they were thinking about, you know, very detailed, uh, heavily information-based uh, models. Um, Whereas what Holling and his crew did was they, they, they picked the conceptual models out of the heads of all of the people involved in the discussion and put those together uh, so that all of those models, sub models were already familiar to the people involved. And by putting them together, they could see how they interacted. And, and that was a huge benefit in getting everybody on the same page. Now, uh, Carl and his students were incredibly skillful at doing that. <laughs> it's not something I would ever be very good at, uh, but uh, if you could, assemble a team that could do that, uh, you could have uh, numerical models of uh, Delta processes put together pretty quickly. And I think those would be really useful to the whole enterprise. Thanks. Um, I saw a comment in the chat from Ted Summer that was related to this. Um, Ted, did you want to chime in? Sure, I, I guess I was wondering 
if we could perhaps differentiate between um, broader management of the region and individual projects. My two cents worth for an individual project, it can be just fine to have a really good monitoring program, including some experimentation and not have a quantitative model. But I, I feel like the quantitative models are more useful to managers kind of looking at the big picture across a region. OK, I'll, I'll, I'll make a comment. Hi, Ted, how are you? I haven't seen you for a while. <clears throat> uh, the, uh, the small local projects, uh, I'm, you know, if they're, if they're designed as an experiment, I'm sure that you can get by without a, a numerical model. Um, but if you're thinking of, about the system as a whole, uh, then each of those local projects should somehow be nested into the system as a whole. So you need to know how it relates in a landscape sense. Uh, to all the other things that are going on. And usually uh, those little local projects are stimulated by uh, some uncertainty that relates to the larger picture. So uh, I think at some point uh, they would need to be incorporated into a uh, numerical evaluation of what's happening. And I would agree with that completely. I think a lot of times the smaller projects are designed to test uncertainties that are related to incomplete knowledge of, of processes within the system. And those processes uh, need further study in order to be corp incorporated into the numerical models that are used to scale up our understanding to the entire system. So I, I agree with both of you. Great, thanks. I think the, the next person up is, uh, there was a hand from Sean Acuna. Sean, I'd welcome you to turn on your camera if, you, if you'd like. Thanks. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, that was uh, a lot of great talks, and it's really helpful to have some of that context. Never had that really explained like that before. I was wondering about when we're stuck talking about the uncertainty, another issue about uncertainty is the data. The data going into these models, if we try to produce a quantitative model, what are your thoughts on the uncertainty? If the data is not sufficient enough, or is felt to be not sufficient enough to create a model, uh, with sufficient um, certainty. Uh, I guess that's kind of subjective, what you would call sufficient certainty. But uh, does it mean that you should definitely rely more on a conceptual model as opposed to a numerical model until you have enough data to reduce that uncertainty? Sure, well, if you can put together a preliminary numerical model using even bad data or guesses, if you uh, uh, that's all you can do, and the first thing you can do is run a sensitivity analysis and see whether or not that aspect of the system is uh, really having a big impact on the way things unfold. Uh, if it's not, uh, then you can sort of set it aside and say, well, we don't need to spend a lot of time uh, dealing with the uncertainty in this aspect because at least in terms of our overall model, it's not having much impact. If it has a huge impact on uh, the output of the model, uh, then it tells you, okay, we've got to get busy and, and firm this up a bit. I will say something else too, and, and one, one of the, and not, not in the Delta because it hasn't been used, but one of the uh, obstacles in other locations to making progress with adaptive management is people get trapped in the modeling phase. They're always so concerned that the model has to be perfect that they never get to any implementation. I'd, yes, that I'd does like seem to, to be to something that. we have a lot. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I, Sorry. I'd, I'd like to add to that with an anecdote. So in the weather forecasting community, we, we started making weather forecasts uh, back halfway through the last century. Uh, those forecasts were initially highly inaccurate, um, but they were still being produced and used in making decisions. And in part, it was learning from the mistakes that caused these forecasts to become a, a much more reliable operational tool at a very rapid clip. I, I've got a statistic in my talk on Friday, but I, I think it's something like the the five day forecasts now are as accurate as the one day forecasts 20 years ago. It's, it's something like that. So we can't wait until we reduce our uncertainty envelopes to a very small level before we uh, take action because that will stimmy progress. We, we learn by doing. 
And I think it's one of the jobs of the managers. Well, it, it's the job of the scientists to clearly communicate what the uh, not just what the probabilistic uncertainty is with the model outcomes, but what our confidence and uh, process level understanding that goes into the, the model is. And then it's the job of the manager to take that uncertainty, that level of confidence into account in weighing risk and making the decision. And maybe I could just add another uh, addendum, and that is that the, the conceptual model is step one. You, you can't do the numerical model until you've got the conceptual model. And even in the absence of the conceptual model, of the numerical model, the conceptual model can be a great tool uh, for uh, trying to get everybody on the same page so that everyone understands what all of the actors are thinking about how the system works and why they think certain things are important. Yeah, thank you. We do create these those uh, numerical uh, those conceptual models quite often. It's the next step that we run into. We have um, so a lot of us would have doubts on whether the data is sufficient enough to create those numerical models, while others think that we should at least try. And um, we tend to get stuck there on some of the times, and we get we just rely on the conceptual models instead. Sure. Well, I, I would certainly if if. Uh... I would certainly encourage you to try building some numerical models, even if there's a lot of uncertainty in what you think are key parameters, and then play with it. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Sean. Um, I'll call next on Rod Whitler. Good morning. Can you hear me? Thank yes. you. Yeah. So, this latest suggestion goes with my question. It seems that adaptive management in a fragile state. Everybody has their own definition, methodology, or process. Um, is adaptive management in its current state or definition of it uh, viable for managing large public works? You know, and it, it just amazes me still uh, we can't build a model of something, or it's hard, um, or when you said we work out our own method of adaptive management, that concerns me from folks outside looking in, it just looks like a fragile way of doing business. Well, you know, the, the, the world is an uncertain place and um, it's all, you know, given the structure of uh, government institutions, it's often very difficult to get everyone on the same page. So one of the challenges of adaptive management is to uh, break down this uh, siloing of uh, units within agencies and between agencies because uh, truly adaptive management is supposed to be a collaborative process. And now when I said that uh, uh, adaptive management evolved differently in different locations, uh, I didn't mean that it was evolving differently in different agencies involved in the California issue because I think uh, here everybody and those from the Delta Plan and, and the other writings, uh, what the expected structure of adaptive management is. Uh, but if you compare California with Florida, or, uh, Missouri, they look pretty different. Uh, yep. This is Phil. Could I, could I uh, just add something? I, I, I would remind everyone that current law uh, requires the De Delta Independent Science Board to provide, uh, I'll read it, oversight of the scientific research monitoring and assessment programs that support adaptive management of the Delta through periodic reviews of each of these programs that shall be scheduled to ensure that all Delta scientific research monitoring and assessment are reviewed at least once every four years and report that to the council. Uh, I mean, it just seems to me if if we're having trouble focusing the discussion of how to define and how to evaluate, why don't we just start with a couple of big, I mean, the science board could, could start their hearings and say, how are we doing on the big project? How are we doing on a small project? I mean, part of the role of, of good science and good evaluation from the science board is hectoring people in a very polite, 
but uh, meaningful way uh, to uh, point out that uh, doing nothing is probably not a good idea. Thanks, Mike and Phil. Next up, um, Brian Keeley. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. OK, good morning. Um, uh, thank you for sharing all this information about adaptive management. Karen, I really like your interpretive comments on what the different speakers say. It's, it's neat, neat to just hear how you're wrapping it up. Um, uh, Mike Healy mentioned that um, the different programs uh, have evolved differently with in terms of adaptive management, how they embrace adaptive management. I mean, uh, you know, evolution is part of, of a adaptation. So I'm kind of curious as to what you saw as how those different programs evolved and embraced this uh, this concept. Okay, well, the, 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 I guess the biggest evolution was that uh, quite a few of these uh, big projects kind of gave up on adaptive management. Uh, mm -hmm. And sometimes that was a political decision. I think sometimes it was an ad administrative decision. Um, and they, in a sense, they all struggled in the way that uh, uh, the Delta has been struggling with. How do you implement this? process uh, within the existing agency structure. Um, the ones that have carried on uh, mostly developed a process early on. It wasn't exactly the same as what's been happening in the Delta, but you know they went 180 degrees different. Uh, and then they stuck to the uh, application of that process, uh, which is what I see happening in California. Um, and so it's not, you know, it's not a wasteland, but uh, there certainly has been, uh, I guess I should say that in the ones that I have some familiarity with, which certainly isn't all of them, um, I don't see anywhere that's doing a better job than uh, you're doing in the Delta. So I wouldn't, certainly wouldn't say you should be discouraged. I think it's, um, it's really a slow process to try to uh, insert a whole new way of doing things into a bunch of different government agencies. In fact, I can't imagine anything harder. So the fact that things have gone as far as they have, uh, and as uh, Kara, Karen says, still changing uh, pretty dramatically, I think is a good sign. Thank you. Thank you. We'll squeeze in one more question before the break. That's uh, a hand up from Anitra Pali. Anitra? Yeah, hi, sorry about that. Um, I just wanted to say that um, in the Delta, we do for large scale restoration projects, uh, particularly tidal marsh projects and floodplain restoration projects and those that are multi-benefit where we have uh, flood management goals as well. I think we're doing better in, than we used to. And I think that we've we've got a lot of hydrological models or hydraulic models, I should say, that we're pursuing, using those to plan our projects. And then to, and then to we can use those, those models afterward to evaluate our projects as well. So I wanted to just mention that. And then um, the second thing is that, in addition, we're doing sediment modeling and also looking at the context of our projects in the entire Delta. So I feel like we have made some great strides in uh, in our modeling processes, processes that support adaptive management. And that's all I wanted to mention. <laughs> Thanks. Sure, that, uh, uh, again, I'll say that's great uh, that you're using uh, numerical models for aspects of your programs. But I guess I, I probably didn't explain this well enough. Uh, the kind of model that I'm thinking about is a management model, mm -hmm. not a model of some physical or biological process. And those sub-models might be part of the overall model, um, but it's 
Uh, really the idea of putting together a numerical model of the system that you can use to game management options. Um, yeah, I and that's, I that's, you know, that's a, a, a rather different model than the ones that many scientists are used to. Yeah, and I, I guess what I'm trying to explain, and maybe I'm not being very clear, but is the interaction between those numerical hydraulic models and management decisions. So we act absolutely have used those to redesign our projects. And yep. then in the end, we can use those same models to because we have we have options and sizes of weirs, sizes of um, whether or not to create tidal marshes, et cetera. I mean, to raise the elevation in some places or another. And so using those models can help us, those 2D models, basically game the system and then make changes in our design and then later to evaluate the, the design. Good. I'm but, delighted to hear that. That's great. Thank you. Um, can I ask a question, Karen? Sure. Uh, I just wanted to ask Phil because he's mentioned this a couple of times. Um, you know, how will we know if adaptive management has succeeded? Um, so since we're talking about outcomes, what, what, what would you want what would tell you that an adaptive management program has succeeded, Bill? Would it be anything like the well, list of stuff that I gave, or would it be totally different? Well, it wouldn't. It wouldn't be convincing to me if it was based on the notion that all the participants are happy with it. Uh, I think that's probably the most uh, the most common way public policy is evaluated. Uh, yeah. I, I'm interested in inserting failures into the evaluation process, articulating the grounds for the failure and making it as publicly as we can, along with successes where it seems to be working. And I'm also in favor of moving toward non-environmental projects for that evaluation as well. Uh, doing what the Delta Stewardship Council staff did on the Twin Tunnels proposal uh, was a foundation that science can build on, hoping that future proposals of a similar scope will not fall into the same trap of uh, a, a meaningless uh, adaptive management program. And I and I like to count things. Um, uh, because I, but I, because I understand and have a measure against which I can make judgments, and I think you've got to move the boundaries of this discussion. You have to narrow the boundaries of the discussion, so uncertainty and certainty uh, get closer together, uh, and you at least have ranges of probability, which become the equivalent of a management tool and thus uh, adaptive management at its best. And also by by refining the definition, you're really forcing project administrators to fess up that what bothers them most is they don't want to be told what to do by anyone and they they need more money to do it anyway. And that's destructive of an adaptive management. That attitude is destructive of uh, any kind of effective adaptive management. Yeah, I, I really agree. And the, this notion of, of failure, which is very hard for uh, most managers to uh, acknowledge, can be can be a great learning opportunity. And adaptive management is in fact intended to uh, provoke failure from time to time in order to learn. Well, consider what we're all going through on the coronavirus and the epidemic. It is kind of a classic illustration of where public policy, public opinion, misinformation, scientific evaluation, chaos is going on. And in that kind of context, if, if, it, if it actually happens, if, you know, President Biden said, we will make mistakes and we'll tell you them. Now, if that happens, ooh, I like that. That's a lot. Anyway, thank you for letting me participate. 
Thank, Thank you, you so for much, participating. Phil. Thank you, Phil and Mike and Laurel. It's time for our break now. Um, Phil, I love how your last comment is a good good entree to our closing plenary. Um, Laurel Larson's going to be speaking specifically about adaptive management in the time of COVID and what we have learned from managing this global pandemic and how we can apply that to, to management of our natural resources. So I'd also say just as we go to break, um, there were some questions and comments in the chat that we couldn't get to. Um, I would encourage the panelists to look in there. We have some great comments from Clint Alexander, Rosie Hartman, Rod Whitler, a question from Susan Tatayan, question from Sarah Young. Um, so if you have the opportunity to look through that that chat, you're you're welcome to respond to more questions in, in the chat as we go on with the day. Um, thank you all so much. This has been a really stimulating panel, and I, I wish we had 20 more minutes to, to keep talking. Um, I'm going to let everybody go to the break. Uh, we have about 10 minutes to stretch your legs and get a fresh cup of coffee. Uh, we'll reconvene at 1045. Um, and just one last plug, too, for the mural. You're welcome to, to continue the conversation on the mural, and Cheryl has reposted the link there. Um, there are a lot, there's been a lot of activity so far this morning on, on the mural, and I'm excited to see um, everybody posting comments there. So thanks, and we'll see you in uh, 10 minutes or so at 1045.